まあ村井優が作ったマクベスっていうのをぜひ見てもらえればと思います。よろしくお願いします。あとマクベスとこのマクベスに予言を授ける魔女っていうものの存在っていうものがあの日本の名作漫画の明日の城という作品がありまして、それにおける主人公の矢吹城っていうのは、それの導き手にあるベンダーというかそういう存在の、まあ、丹下断片というか存在がいまして、まあ、それになぞらえられるんじゃないかなっていうようなところで発想を得ましたよねでまあなのでもシェイクスピアの戯曲とこの日本の漫画っていうものの何ていうか融合というかそういうものっていうのは僕らにしかできないことなんじゃないのかなっていうのが。明日の情報、マックマクベスはそれぞれ、えー、と明日の情報は丹下なので、でマクベスは魔女、それぞれ言葉のささやきによって、えー、とアクションを起こしていくストーリーになっているので、僕らはそれを合わせた明日の魔女という作品を見てもらって、お客さんに対しての僕らの言葉のささやきが伝わって、お客さんがどういう動きを、ね、アクションを起こしてくださるのかっていうのが楽しみです。Tell us about Ashita Nobajo and what you want New York audiences to know about it. Japan Society of Kikaku, the Senkyo, the Kikaku, 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 それの2つの作品を運動させてるんですけどどちらもヒーロー,ヒー,ローではあるんですねでその1960年代とかっていうのはヒーローっていうものが確実に存在していたと思うんですけど今の我々が生きている年代だとヒーローなる時代もちろん僕個人的には憧れるヒーローとかいませんしそうすると、えー、と心のどこかにもう一人自分の期待っていうことでもあるんですけど、えっと、自分がヒーローにならなきゃいけないんじゃないかまでいかなくても自分がヒーローになれるんじゃないかっていうような期待と同様に脅迫観念プレッシャーっていうのがすごい時代だと思うんですその中でまあ僕としてはそのヒーローっていうものがどういうふうにヒーローになれるかなんてことはわからないんですけど今ここにいる自分と違う自分っていうのを探した結果、えー、何者かになれるんじゃないかなって思って、えー、日本人である自分が一番遠いところである海外に行けば、えー、自分っていうものが見つかるんじゃないかな、まあ、自分探しの対象なんですけどそういう思いで海外全然自分のこと知らない人たちの前で作品を見てもらうってことはすごい僕らにとってはなかなか得,得られない刺激的な、ね、機会だと思うので,そ,で、えー、それがそれを得たいために海外に行きたいとかなので,なので、えー、ニューヨークの、えー、皆さんも僕らを見てそういう僕らから刺激を受けて。受けてもらって、こういう日本からわざわざ来て、こういうパフォーマンスプレーをして、自分たちに訴えてくるものがあるなって思ってくれたら、そのお客さんたちも、いつもの自分と違う自分っていうのを見つけれる機会が少しでもあれば嬉しいなと思います。2009年に一度ニューヨークで公演させていただいたんですけれども、10年ぶりにあのこのサイドにニューヨークで公演できることがすごい、えー、嬉しく思っております。えー、2009年の時に見に来てくれた方も、それから見てない方も、多くの方に、ちょっと今の,あの日本の東京で、えー、作られたマクベス、まあ、村井優が作ったマクベスっていうのをぜひ見てもらえればと思います。よろししくお願いしますマクベスとマクベスに予言を授けるマジックっていうものの存在っていうものが、日本の名作漫画、明日の城という作品がありまして、それにおける主人公の矢吹城というのは、それの導き手にあるベルメラーというのが、そういう存在の
Theater Center at the Graduate Center of CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke, I'm the director of the Siegel <coughs> Theater Center. Today is a, a special day, not only we have a 6.30 program with Julia Charco, who is a head of playwriting also at NYU, but as an uh, important additional event we are presenting today, uh, the very special new issue from the American Theater Magazine, which is here on theater in Japan, on contemporary theater in Japan. As you know, uh, whoever follows our programs here at the Siegel Center, know that we're deeply engaged uh, with contemporary Japanese theater. We have two times presented uh, a series with uh, playwrights who we invited here, translations, many, many events in between. And um, of course, also our faculty member, Peter Eckersall, is the foremost Asian theater specialist in the country here. So um, we are uh, uh, good uh, friends and partners um, with uh, our Japanese theater friends. Um, we have with us the Japan Foundation, who has been also a great supporter of our work. And again here, they also have uh, supported the travels and the work of uh, Cindy Sibelski and Shin Kurukawa, who created uh, that very, very uh, special issue which we have here. And I think we have some floating around. I hope you can get it, but everybody knows American theater is a significant, important uh, magazine from the theater industry and also for the theater landscape here um, in uh, America. Um, Rob uh, Weinert Kent also is a good friend. We have done one or two events with him here at the Siegel Center. But um, again, uh, the focus on uh, Japanese theater is something that, of course, intrigues us. And this was really a very, uh, very, uh, how would one say, uh, Herculean uh, effort over five, six months to really have a look at Japanese theater at the moment and put it into um, um, a magazine. Everybody who has ever done such a work really knows. Um, what that uh, means. Uh, we have uh, with here, of course, today, Cindy, where is she, is here, who put this together, and uh, Shin, who also is creating a documentary. We'll see a trailer of their upcoming work. And uh, then we have Peter Eckersall here with us, uh, uh, Yoko Shuya from the Japan Society, Yoko is there, and Kyoki, uh, Kyoko Iwaki, who is also a visiting scholar at the moment and a theater critic, a, a prominent one in, in, and researcher in, in Japan. The Siegel Center bridges academia and professional theater, American and international theater, and um, so we have a, a very a long tradition also collaborating with Japan Society, so it's a great honor for us to host this. Um, there will also be a little reception not here in the room because we will have to prepare for the upcoming evening, but there's a bar around the corner, it's called the Archive Bar. It's on 36 between 5th and Madison, and I have the address with me, so come with me, walk with me, or I give you the little uh, handout. So you will um, uh, 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 celebrate this, I think, real achievement. And I think the Siegel Center is known for really celebrating the work of artists, but we also celebrate the work of curators, editors, publishers, writers, and we think it's a very significant 
uh, contribution. Again, uh, thanks to the Japan Foundation. We have the great Kenji Matsumoto with us here, who has been a great friend of the Siegel Center, and also Kochi and, Kochi and Kanako, where are they? Oh, they are here, here, so also thank you very much for coming. And um, we have the rundown of the event and the bios in our program. But now I also have the pleasure to give uh, the microphone over to American Theatre Magazine, who would like to say, of course, a few words about this major effort they put out. Uh, Russell uh, Denben is here with us, but also um, Alison Considine. And uh, Alison will give us a few words and then hand the microphone over to Cindy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Alison. I'm the associate editor at American Theatre Magazine. And we are so glad that you are here to help us celebrate the, uh, the beautiful May-June issue that we put together. Uh, American Theatre Magazine is published by Theatre Communications Group, the National Service Organization for U.S. Nonprofit Theatre. TCG has more than 500 member theatres across the U.S. It's the largest independent trade publisher of dramatic literature in North America, and uh, we are the exclusive distributor of the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Center's publishing wing. Individual membership to TCG includes an annual subscription to American Theatre Magazine and full access to our content on americantheatre.org. In addition, TCG membership offers access to art, art search job listings, discounts on publications, theatre tickets, and more. So for some more information, be sure to grab a copy of the magazine and there's some membership info inside. And I'd now like to introduce you to Cindy Sibilski, the guest editor and curator for this very special issue. So, thank you. Hello, everybody. So, um, to get us started tonight, again, thank you so much for being here. This means a lot. Uh, this kind of came about with a conversation I was having with Teresa Eyring, who couldn't be here. She's the president of TCG. And we were talking about my international work as a producer and press and I said, well, I love American Theatre Magazine. It'd kind of be a dream to write for it. And she said, well, propose to Rob to be a guest editor. We don't really have that, but why not? And amazingly, he accepted, and he accepted my proposal on Japanese contemporary theater. So when that happened, then I had to realize, oh, I've got to go to Japan and see more theater. And that's when uh, two people were extremely helpful. Japan Society, Yoko Shoya and then Japan Foundation, without whom this would have not been possible at all. Both supported me, set up all the interviews with these luminaries, and you're gonna see some of that. Uh, were you watching the video beforehand, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we actually have the cast and the company from Ashita no Majo that's playing through this weekend at Japan Society. It's a combination of manga, which is Ashita no Jo, and Macbeth. It's insane. If you miss it, you're insane. I've seen about every bit math possible. It is my favorite, and that is not lip service because they're here, because I'm speaking in English. So they probably couldn't understand if I said otherwise. But the truth of the matter is the show is phenomenal. The company's phenomenal. We had our interview with them and have become very close with a lot of these Japanese companies. So to that, Shen and I are making a little mini documentary from our experiences and we've got an extremely rough cut to show you. So again, not audio fix, nothing. What this is, is a tiny glimpse of the 30 plus interviews we conducted with some of the most important figures in Japanese theater. We saw over 20 shows and this is kind of just a tiny, tiny taste of that. So please enjoy. This is Cindy Sabilski reporting from Nijojo Castle from Kyoto, Japan. In the next coming weeks, we're going to be doing special features, exclusive interviews with the most important theatrical figures in Japan contemporary theater right now. This is part of a special edition of American Theater Magazine out in May, June, where I will be covering the very best of Japanese contemporary theater with several Japanese colleagues. It's going to be very exciting. Stay tuned. Tell us about your thoughts on contemporary Japanese theater, how you fit into it, and what you hope for for the future. Eto, 
日本語から遠いところに行きたいなと思って、えー、海外を、えー、拠点にしたいと思って海外の活動してますんで、えー、とそれは、えー、ひるがえって考えると,、えー、と日本語がもっともっと身近になっていくなって思,思ってますなので、えー、僕周りの同世代の劇団もですねたくさん海外に行って僕らはその海外を拠点にする同士が欲しいなと思っている次第でありますもっと海外にみんな行けばいいなと思ってます僕大学時代です。まず大学時代に影響を受けたというか、あの日本の文学者で谷崎潤一郎っていう小説家がいるんですけど、えっとそこでその小説のタデクイモっていう小説があって、そこにちょっと文学の一節が入ってるんです、ねうん。で、それを読んで、あなんかあの面白そうな世界をまあ文章で描いてるなと思って、それで見たいなと思ったのが最初。実際にあのとにかく見て、まあ、3人使いで3人で人気をやってるんですけど、うん、あのなんていうんだろう段、まあ、に分かれてるというかあのお話がこういくつかの構成でされてるんですけどあの一つのセットで、まあ、役者さんが演じる、うん、あの人形がまあ演じるんですけどそこでこうなんかなんていうんだろうちょっとした仕草とかリアルにあ結構リアクションが大きいところは分かりやすいんですけど何もしてないと例えばこう何かお茶を立ててあタバコを吸うとかそういう仕草がすごくなんかこう自然でちょっとそういう影響を僕の相手一緒にも入れたいなと。What's your vision for both yourself and Japanese contemporary theater for the future? I have seen the contemporary theater of the future. I have seen the contemporary theater of the future. I have seen the contemporary theater of the future. I have seen the contemporary theater of the future. 真の持っているお互いを認め合おうという精神はやっぱり何かの影響があって世界に伝えていきたいという気持ちはあります。た,ただ日本コンテンプラリーセンターが全部どうだとはまだ言えないかな。今僕は日本はね不思議な本当にねプロテンアランドだと思ってるんですよ。<笑>すごいだ,だからこそある意味では何かを知らないこともある。外の世界を知らないっていう。弱さでもそれがいい意味でお互いを信用しようとする気持ちにつながっているところもある、うん、今大きく日本は変わり目になっていてどんどん外国人の方が増えてきた時に初めて日本人はちょっと待てよとその優しさだけではない何かも必要なのかいやだからこそ優しさが必要なのかというこの2つの道に分かれているような気がするんですがただ今のいまだ日本人の持っているそういう人への思い人の心を読もうとする気持ちっていうのは大切だとは思います。What do you predict for the future of Chambara style、um, performance on stage? Of course, we see it in the movies,、mm. but what, what would you like to see and what do you think will happen? Future.、Mm. Mm. So, yeah, the Nihon no culture, you know, the Sekai Jude is a good guy, she created she, Tada, Nihon was a good guy, and the Nakanaka was a good guy, the performance was a good guy. 世界をこう回っていくっていうことがなかなかできないんですけれどもでも僕の夢はカムイでジャパニーズのトラディショナルとかポップカルチャーとかいろんなミュージックとかいろんなものをミクスチャーしてでカムイ侍を侍がフラッグシップになってそれであの世界をこう回ってワールドツアーシアトルあとはオフコースムービーそしてあとはスクールもですね今やっていることをステップアップさせていってで一番大事なのは僕がアーティストとしてもちろんブランディングもしていきたいんですけれどもそれだけではなくて次のネクストジェネレーションにあの作品を残していくっていうことを大事に
、えー、これからもみんなと活動していきたいなと思いますだからニューヨークにもスクール作りたいですね、うん、そしてパフォーマンスをブロードウェイでやりたいですはい How do you feel 2.5D musicals fit into the contemporary Japanese theater market? あのもう日本の中で一つのジャンル、まあ、ずっと僕らはそのいわゆるこうブーム、うんえー、一過性のブームじゃなくてちゃんとジャンルとして日本のエンターテインメントの一つとしてジャンルになりたいって思ってるしもっと言うと世界のジャンル 2.5 ジャパニーズ 2.5 ミュージカルっていうものが世界のジャンルになるように頑張ってる、うん、で今は日本の中で特に若い世代にとっては一つのジャンルとして。確立しつつあるというのが今の現状。About the Asian market and how it's seen, and as you said, A fair representation of the culture as a whole, and no one else has done it. So it's intriguing to me looking at the timeline, as you've mentioned. Japan's theater industry has definitely been a stronger presence in the global market more than other Asian nations. So it would seem logical the first to be able to break in that way. Would be Japan and would likely be Shiki because you have been building this for decades. So, to that, what, what would you like to, and this is of course just dreaming, what kind of stories would you like for Japan to tell the world that are not that just exotic orientalism that people are, are assuming? What, what stories are both Japanese and universal that is moving towards that? I know that that's a, a large thing to ask. <laughs> あの海外のライセンサーから、まあ、あの受け入れている作品のようなですねあの普遍的なテーマと魅力を持ったものを作りたいこれはだからアジアの特殊なあの演劇だから珍しいから見に行こうと思われてるじゃダメですね食べ物で例えればオリエンタルな香辛料であるうちはそんなに豪華を受け入れられないでしょそんなものたくさん必要ないわけです我々だからそのあのパンやそのなんていうかなライスといった主食じゃなくて日常的にあの食べていただけるようなものを何にも意識せずそういうものを作らなければいけないそれと、えー、もう一つ言うと今は本気になって我々やってるわけですけれども日本の,、まあ、あのいろんなプロダクションがそれこそ生きるや愛が目指して頑張ってる生きるやデスノートのようなものとかねただ我々はあの開発のためのインフラがもう十分にあるんですまずここがありますよね開発のパフォーマンスとにかく。あの24時間使いたいだけ使えるわけですそれからそれからいろんな例えば支援会であったり読み合わせであったりあの場面の点検であったりを必要な俳優たちはたくさんいるそれからあとあの海外の非常に何て言うかな複雑なテクニックを使った舞台を完全に再現できる能力を持った技術者がこれまたやっぱり400人ぐらいいますこの人たちをフル回転させるということですねそれであのこの仕事が望んでいます That's so wonderful. It's much more than I expected. How, how thrilling about the future and interesting that the concerns about the future are actually serving as an impetus to do great things. It starts with a dream. And that's how, I mean, look, look at what happened with Angela Weber, with Disney, with. Shiki itself attend university students and now this. So, this is a memorial room. Yes. I know what I know. 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 I k n View into the documentary that's upcoming, and maybe we go right away uh, to our panel. Michael, Cindy will start, but I'm going to ask the panelists uh, to come, uh, Peter and uh, Kyoko and uh, Yoko, to uh, join us. Yeah, you sit there in the middle. You sit next to Peter. 
So um, push the microphone up on top. Uh, not only that we hear each other better, but also the great HowlRound is live streaming in this event. So again, thanks to um, HowlRound. Um, first, Cindy, maybe uh, you brought a couple of slides, but you know, maybe a bit. I did. Than um, so tell us a little bit about the experience and the journey you made. What surprised you, mm. and uh, what was a discovery? Well, uh, yeah, we'll take the first slide. So this is the company Shochko. And uh, what do we see here? Does anyone recognize any of the characters or what these figures might be? Miku, right? Hatsune Miku, mm -hmm. that's her. And what about the other guy? Does anyone know what that kind of a look is? Kabuki, right. So Kabuki is a 400 year old tradition and a lot of Japanese theater, what's really amazing about it is how its traditions transform. So they're taking these ancient arts, no theater is actually the oldest continually practiced theater in the world, and Kabuki is one of them. They have continued well, there's this. There's Katakali dance well, in yes, India, there are well, many others, but yes, it's one of arts, the oldest. But as far as, yes. as, far as theater, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. But as far as um, pure theater with the text, um, it is one of the oldest, for sure. And something that the artists are doing now is bringing it to the contemporary realm. So this is very exciting as far as the Shakespeare productions, like Ashita no Majo, like Metal Macbeth, which is on our cover, and elements like this, with, which is called Chokabuki, which means extreme or super kabuki, and what this is is this a fusion of bringing together the old and the new. Mm -hmm. And then the next one. And on that note, a big thing is high tech. This probably doesn't surprise anybody about the Japanese being very forward thinking with the high tech. So you have companies like Nibrol that use, their dance company primarily will use the some text, but incredible video projections, really the wildest stuff. And this actually is architectural technology. This is from IHI Stage Around Tokyo, which is the second in the world of a 360 degree theater experience. And this was a show called Seven Souls in the Skull Castle by Gekiren Shinkansen. Really amazing samurai drama, epic opera, everything you could want revolving around you quite literally. And then we got the next one. And then this is a piece of actually Antigone. So another, this is from Spock from Satoshi Miyagi-san. This is, Spock is the Shizuka Performing Arts Center. Well, oh, it's right here, we have a visual. <laughs> And this is actually gonna be coming to New York in September, so uh, to the Park Avenue Armory, so please everybody mark your calendars for that. Um, what's exciting about this is what the theater companies are doing now, that they're going not only abroad in the West, there was Japanisma that was in Paris, that was all over France, they're coming to America, but also looking East a lot more. And that's really exciting to see how the Asian nations are now collaborating and having culture exchange themselves. Wonderful, thank you um, so much. Um, Peter, um, um, I think you uh, wrote a bit about TPAM and uh, other things, so why, why should we look you know, by, uh, at Japanese theater? Well, um, hi everyone. Um, uh, I, I was asked to, uh, this was part of a, a whole, um, I think, big plan to try and get a diverse coverage of trends, various trends in Japanese theater because I mean, there's so much to cover from the traditional worlds right through to the modern drama and then also the various contemporary circles of performance that are taking place. So uh, Cindy uh, actually commissioned articles specifically from people to focus on different things. And one of the things that I'm interested in is not so much the, the Gekinan Shiki or the contemporary commercial work, but I work very much on the, um, the, the theatre that came out of the 1960s underground and what we might call the contemporary theatre movement of Japan. So I'm very interested in the playwrights and directors that have come out of that. And also one of the trends, I think, was that when I started working with Japanese artists in the 1990s, uh, that the trend was to, if you had a successful show, to try and tour it to an arts festival in Europe or perhaps do a collaboration with Australian artists or uh, occasionally to come to New York as well. Um, but there was you know, very little attention given to the region that Japan is in. I mean, and so what I did in my piece for the, the, the contribution was to perhaps look at some of the histories of 
the, uh, Japan's kind of touring relationship and artistic relationship to artists in the region because what we see is uh, since the 1960s a kind of way in which uh, the first communications were of course um, I guess foregrounded by uh, the reality of Japan's history and, and the wartime memories and so it was quite a quite an important gesture to for a company to go and work with or collaborate with artists in China. Of course, China was also in the midst of a very particular time of its history with the Cultural Revolution, uh, and also, you know, looking in the 1980s, where people like Hidata Oizawa took his company to Korea and made very strong relations there. And then I wrote right up to the present day, where for the last uh, five or six years, the Tokyo Performing Arts Meeting has had a a very strong focus on uh, kind of curating or producing certain kinds of networks for artists to work inter-regional. And it's been very interesting because I go to that, uh, I tend to try and go to that meeting every year um, to see younger artists, the new generation of artists forging links, uh, not so much with Europe or the United States, but actually with artists in Southeast Asia, East Asia, and uh, West Asia. And so there is this very strong conversation now, I think, that uh, is a very interesting one that is leading to new forms because these artists are collaborating, bringing their own traditions and their own histories, um, leading to new kinds of um, negotiations of language. And also, I guess, um, the cultural politics of this are really fascinating because they're pioneering. Uh, they're a generation of people who are perhaps um, imagining a new possibility for the way in which the region can exist. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. How many uh, did you c uh, commission? How many contributions? Um, so, in total, let's see. I had four, More, yes, yeah. four contributors, and then Shoya San was uh, interviewed as well. Yeah, so uh, talk about your interview, uh, Yoko, which is also published um, um, in, the, uh, uh, in the magazine and online, I think, even in a longer version. Um, what did you focus on? What do you feel was important that the readers of the American Theatre Magazine knew? Um, I haven't read this um, print version. Your interview, just your interview. Yeah, <laughs> just my interview. Well, that interview was about the how, um, how I pick up the production that I brought from Japan and introduced, I mean, a present in How do you answer. pick? So what, how you live, you know in New York so well, you're here for uh, yeah. almost well, years. There yeah. are, there how do you do that? Why, how do you say this is significant, New Yorkers should see it? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Um, I mean, there are many angles and many criteria. So, um, but then anyway, the most important thing is that the, um, what I brought is something that you don't normally see in this city. Talking about, in, I mean, speaking of in this city, New York, you know, it's plenty of uh, theater, um, commercial, experimental, large, small, you know, the, the, or workshops and stuff like that. I still can see um, things that we don't normally see in this country. In that sense, um, normally I don't really quite, uh, although I enjoyed very much of the production or whatever, everything, I don't quite uh, bring the things which are in my, probably my language, straight theater. So the beginning, something happens, dynamism, something happens, and then the end. Like very linear story. That is usually I don't really bring. And then also uh, the body movement or the relationship between two bodies or multiple bodies that relationship or the pace of the uh, relationship, changing the relationship of the body, that is something that I quite often uniqueness in Japan that you don't really see. That's, of course, you know, it's a time, theater is a time-based art, arts. So um, that's how we pace, what yeah, conveniently called pace, is very important uh, elements to make the theater theater. So that's another thing. And then, of course, the actually in a long history of Japan society and the Japan society's performing arts program, which started in uh, 1953, the I, when I became the director, I was the, uh, the first Japanese director whose 
body, uh, whose mother language is Japanese. And body too. More <laughs> <laughs> yeah, body <laughs> as well. Yes. So, um, hundred percent Japanese. So, um, the you know the theater is you when you see like a German theater or the uh, you know French theater, whatever. I. Th I think you feel that the, uh, following the story or uh, following the dialogue, you know, the language is not really about theater. In addition to the, the music or the sound or lighting or the projection or anything, it's, it's, it's following the language is not about telling you what this theater is about. And there are many layers or hidden hint or connotation or references, which is very far connotation, but if you are original Japanese, you immediately click what it means, which actually many elements of the Ashitan Majo that is happening in Yatsu Japan Society. I have a, a postcard, so please pick up in the programs. I it's in a program, of course. And then, um, anyway, I, I'm so accustomed well, to do the you. commercial yeah. when I'm speaking. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> no, but yeah. thank you, thank you. So we understand, and you have, and the Japan Society for a long time, also you people uh, before you, we have presented e exquisite, fantastic, brilliant work, um, and really something we don't see. Um, Kyoko, um, tell us about uh, w your contribution, what you felt um, American readers should know about Amer or Japanese theater. Okay. Um, for me, um, I'm writing, so where should I start? So my research was on, I think most of you know that in 2011, Japan had a real uh, huge nucle nuclear crisis with earthquake and tsunami, so it's a, it's a triple attack. And from that point onwards, for me, and, and also for all, a, a lot of people who are involved in Japanese theater, the, the vision of uh, towards reality has changed um, to a certain degree, depending on who you are. I don't say everyone has changed. Um, most everyone in commercial theater has not changed from my perspective. Um, most of the people who responded are those people who um, are recently called as the, the weaker strand. There is this word called weak strand <laughs> right now. So there's those people who are deliberately um, using their bodies to um, convey these little voices which are being swept away by this huge money coming in from Olympics right now. So my vision was to portray kind of a negative um, picture. Um, for instance, if the positive picture was um, this huge Olympics um, narrative coming out from a huge money, huge governmental funding, um, the, the other side, the, the darker side or the weaker side is the voices that I wanted to introduce through my article. So it's mainly about, uh, my article was about robots or animals or spiritual things, which is actually what human people now want to relate a little bit more than actually pre-Fukushima, because they, um, from my perspective, they're being more secluded. I mean, it hasn't started like in a, from 2011, it was already starting from this economical downturn that started in the 90s. But then it's becoming more and more because of this economical, situ uh, economical as well as ecological situation that's happening right now. So people feel threatened by other humans that they could communicate uh, the same thing, which is a, a fear actually in Japan because we are considered a homogenous society which is threatening for me, but for Japanese people, that's peaceful. And um, they think that, okay, we can't assume now that everyone is looking at the same reality. So they think that if I am having a conversation, for instance, with you, Frank, we might be seeing a different reality per se, because this water right here, you might think it's not contaminated and drink it, whereas I could just bring in an Evian and say, I'm sorry, I can't drink it because I think that's not really safe. And there's a invisible division between there. So that kind of invisible reality could be visualized through theater from my perspective. So Through non-human uh, exactly. robot or animals or spiritual yeah. thinking. Um, but before we open up um, um, also to the audience, a question to all of you maybe, what, uh, what would you say to American or European theater makers? What, what can you learn from Japanese theater? What is unique or special? What is something one could pay special attention to 
but something that they are perhaps at the avant-garde, like one step uh, ahead. You know, of course, it's a global uh, world we live in. Dramaturgy is local, but also global, and uh, there is an interaction. But still, is there something you all think this is something we, uh, the world might know more about or should? I, I think the thing that I noticed most of all with the through line from the absolute fringe to the complete commercial of even shows that I had seen before, like Cats, is the physicality. So in Japanese theater, the cornerstone to me is its, its corporal realities. Everything is physically based. I don't know, based. is completely Japanese theater. Uh, by, no, by, but, but, shows but they you, were um, Japanese actors. Ja Japan so, oh, you so, mean the acting style. So yeah. to me, seeing over 20 shows in this span of time, from the most French to the most commercial of even an American musical, they all had this same physical presence that is stronger than I've seen of any culture. <laughs> And that's the basis of the acting. A lot of that does come from the origins, the roots of no and kabuki. And you can see that in the modern works too, that it's so much physically based so that even um, in a Chekhov play, you knew of the three women, though I couldn't understand a word of it because it was all in Japanese, the one with the, the slight hunch was a little more shy. The one like that, it was that obvious. And that's kind of something really beautiful I noticed throughout every single show that the physicality is the cornerstone. Yeah, the representation of the body uh, mm -hmm. on a stage. Yoko, what do you think is, uh, um, <laughs> you, but you also, we are here, we are, you have here on the panel, what do you think? I mean, you are curating the plays. What do you feel um, is something that you say, you know, this is something um, that really I wish that no, actually, I see more I, in America. I need a little more time to think about, so that's why okay, I- Okay, very good, that. okay, okay. Uh, well, it's a very big question, yeah. I think, but uh, just to try and answer it briefly with two perspectives. The first one is history and the way that uh, Japanese theatre engages with a, a kind of parallel modernity to uh, the experience of European or American theatre, and that's a very profound and interesting um, thing to think about, the fact that there is uh, alternative versions of a, of a certain kind of modernity that I think are really important to think about. But the second one I think is, uh, and I'm answering this more as, a, as, as an Australian artist who worked a lot in Japan and the reason why we looked uh, to make our artistic partners with Japan going back to the 1980s and 90s. Um, and that was a certain sensibility about space because, uh, and I think Kyoko's rightly pointed out the fact that there are a lot of artists and not just uh, performing artists, but um, writers and um, filmmakers uh, in, and, and visual artists in Japan that, that give us a very comprehensive and uh, really important um, understanding of the way in which we live in a, in a spatial environmental world. And I think that that's becoming increasingly important. So. <laughs> I don't know, the, your question is uh, what American can learn from could Japanese? Learn. What do you think is something that yeah, could, could be inspiring, what do you think could is something that uh, is um, unique about it? Uh, okay, um, I I'm, I'm could tell from a very kind of negative um, standpoint, um, the, in Japan, Basically, I would say it's not too exaggeration that the, if uh, when I say Japanese doesn't have a higher education for the theater. University in Japan normally do not have a, a theater practical study. So there's no uh, academism there in, in, in practicing. I mean, there are many critics and writers and stuff like that, but then in practicing point of view of making theater, there's no higher education, almost none. It's not really absolutely none, but none is not exaggeration. So then there's no a method or um, this school or that school or anything. That's probably one of the uh, keys that really the rebel of the creation happens in the theatre world. So that's why I said that negative point of view, because I don't really appreciate that the uh, academic uh, practicing system is not existing. I don't really appreciate it, but it might be a kind of power of a very unique way of expression is happening. Another thing, again, in a, a negative point of view is that it's kind of becoming uh, uh, different, which I probably I mentioned on an interview on uh, American theater, but in Japan, there's a, a company system 
the founder, writer, directors of same person who formed the company. And then um, I think that I mentioned to that. It is called, uh, I called, and then also my former colleague and well-known uh, translator and the theater maker called uh, Aya Ogawa also mentioned that it is like a mafia system. <laughs> so mafia boss work with the same um, actors. And then a mafia boss is responsible that everybody can have some kind of role in his creation. So he writes the play and then, oh my God, Frank doesn't have a role in this play. I have, no. to, yeah, I, have, I, I have to put him on the stage. So adding some kind of character, which is not really necessary at all for the plot. <laughs> of course not. Yeah, but then I have to be royal because he has been royal to me as a, uh, you know, the mafia boss. So then the great, great thing about, first, great thing about is that the director, such writer, um, do not really have spent too much time for um, forming his creative team. Very reliable. Um, you know, in this country, writers are really waiting that to, be, to be picked up by directors who, you know, try your, your work. Directors always looking for the good actor, and then good actor, oh great, and then workshop, second time, oh, he is hired by better job, and stuff like that. That's constant uh, challenge, yeah. yeah. So the idea well, of, there's the uh, Japanese, the auteur du, du théâtre, in a way, like the Right, French however, films, as so. I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, arts for art's sake point of view, I just mentioned that Frank's role is not really necessary <laughs> for the great way of writing the play, but then I have to add it because of the Frank. And so then, then, then also as a director, I know who can do what kind of thing. So it's not really um, being challenged the situation for your own creation, but back and between back and forth between a director and the actor, and then a director said something, and an actor said, "Oh no, 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 it's not. It doesn't work. I'll do this. I'll do that." That's kind of encounter or exchange yeah. doesn't happen so in Japan. A, yeah. So it's, it's a pros and cons. But then that is another. Yeah. In, in, in practicality, it's very good system that you, e I would say, easily put uh, the idea into the to reality. Into work. Yeah. Um, Kyoko, is there a comment from you to say what you feel? Um, you, I know you're also a curator. You're curating a big f upcoming festival in Tokyo. What do you feel okay. is a, 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 a Japanese okay. theater uh, discovered something that is of in might of be of interest? Um. So to, to correct, I'm not curating, I'm just assisting. Assisting, I'm sorry, yes. So, um, but anyway, um, I think because Japan is in a really unique position in terms of after Second World War, um, we were of course conquered by Americans and, and then we were the conquerors of Asia, right? So we are in this kind of um, um, dual standpoint in terms of how to understand modernity. Um, so when American people see Japan, they will see like an epitome of toxic element gushing out from America. So these kind of depression, psychological depression, um, um, of course, um, capitalism, and then people being like secluded and I mean, succeeding is like the only way of living your social life in Japan that is kind of becoming like the, the trigger of uh, maybe a lot of suicides. And so this kind of uh, corporate kind of being, you have to be a corporate being to be understood as like a, a mature human being in Japan, which is already um, dissolving anyway from the 1990s, but then we have to kind of hang on to it because we think that that's the only way to sort of survive. And we have to kind of, um, um, dislodge this narrative right now, which is happening anyway, but all the people who are living in Japan cannot stand that narrative because we were following the American footsteps. And then we are now looking to Asia to kind of see that, okay, are we still like number one in Asia? And that is not true either. And then we have to kind of relocate ourselves in Asia also. And then there's stories because we're getting weaker a lot of people, Asian people, are just say, um, offending us to apologize, of course, of course, for the past half a century, which we have been doing, but not properly. And then there's this kind of negotiation, again, politically, sociologically, whatever. And so we are in this very fragile moment right now, becoming like a prism, reflecting a lot of um, 
global issues from Western perspective as well as Asian perspective. And um, we have to kind of, we meaning Japanese people, have to relocate and reconfigure ourselves as Japanese and not hang on to the Japanese vision which was there until the 1980s, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe one last uh, remark on contemporary writing in Japan. Um, uh, people say well, there's kind of a renaissance in a way of writing or playwriting in New York. Uh, um, after a while, it's maybe a little bit away again from ensemble work, but how is it in Japan? I know you already said that they work in ensemble, but what are, what are new ideas, new ways of uh, writing for the theater? Is there, are there impulses coming out of Japan at the moment? Well, I think a big one that um, one of my entire features is about is anime and manga on stage. And that can be everything from hyper-commercial to Ashita no Majo, which is more bizarre and avant-garde. But because anime and manga is such an important part of Japanese culture, such a significant and major force, it's a natural transition. And this is something that's been happening since it, the first show was in the 70s, but really since the early 2000s is the boom. And it's one of the biggest markets there. So that's kind of something exciting because it's a newer form of, of Japanese theater. Um, the, I think that, that these days, well, very recently, I think that young people started to look at uh, the inspirational source in Japanese traditional stories, like no stories, or at least started to interest in looking into that. I mean, uh, for the significance of Japanese culture, not just the theater, but in nature, Tomino especially, is that really, including my generation, very much detached from traditional. So you go to no theater, American goes to no theater first time, nothing different for contemporary Japanese, but they have no idea, no knowledge, no education, no nothing. But so then, pro, so then like Kinoshita Kabuki, it's a contemporary theater, but then they are, they, they, they are, their story is all about the Kabuki and then very different way of, um, you know, um, direction. And then also Toshiki Okada, which was commissioned, but then rewrote the old Kyongen thing as well. And so comparing with what happened in this Western uh, world, like uh, taking the, uh, the inspiration or the story from a Greek, or a Greek classics or Shakespeare's or, you know, whatever classic genre, we see so many. Comparing with that, Japanese theater had not really seen that thing, but then I think it's becoming more happening. Thank you. Um, I, I, guess, I guess there's a lot of different examples you could say, but the one that I'm most involved with at the moment is the work of Okada, um, because I'm working on a, a, an edited volume of essays and, and play translations of his work, and he has been one of the most active and visible of the Japanese playwrights. Uh, firstly, you know, as a, as a young um, playwright writing about the experience of uh, subcultures and youth generation in the early 21st century in Japan, and more recently as a more mature writer, uh, writing very much about ecological and political themes to do with the, uh, the sense of loss after um, 311, after the triple disaster. Um, and his playwriting has evolved. I mean, his use of language has evolved, but so is his concern about language. I think he's got some very interesting perspectives on uh, quite philosophical perspectives and, and you know, sometimes very existential on, on the question of Japanese language itself and, and how the language responds to trauma uh, and how the language responds to uh, the kind of um, social experience that uh, Kyoko's just so excellently described. Kyoko, do you have um, a thought? Just simple. Um, there is this thing called monologue theater coming right now in Japan. A lot of people just write long monologues for one hour. And that is called monologue theater. And people think that, okay, we, we don't want to listen to your babbling for one hour. But that is how it goes when you enter a theater right now and 20-something person, a playwright, is writing. 
he wants to write a monologue, because, and that stems from what I said, actually, because after Fukushima, people don't want to pee, um, speak with other person, interact, because dialogue is all about lying. You know, you just present yourself as a likable person so that you won't be hated by the person in front of you. And then you're constantly lying or performing yourself, and then monologue only becomes your own true um, loyal <laughs> feeling. And so there is this thing called monologue theater right now. It's true, Will you die? who came, uh, we did this Japanese playwright exchange, you know, his work, of course, stands for that. Uh, Michael, um, if you could put up the light uh, for the audience, so we're gonna go right away to question George, maybe you could help us and run uh, the mic. Um, Again, we are live streaming, uh, not only we will hear you better with a microphone, but also for our audiences, it's important that you take the microphone, maybe introduce yourself as your name, and uh, um, if, if you take a question, but it doesn't have to be a question, it can also be a comment, so a little bit more light um, on the audience, and is there anything um, here, yeah, over there. Hi, my name is John Bremner, um, I'm a video designer here in New York City. And so my question is going to naturally be one about technology and kind of going back a little bit. Um, I found it really intriguing that we spoke about how Japanese has very little higher education in theater. Um, and Cindy, you touched on how technological prowess is embraced, which I thought was an interesting contrast to here in the States where we have a lot of pedagogy and process and resource. And at the same time, I find myself in my profession very challenged to present video in theater. And I'm curious to know, do you see that as a barrier or like when translating work from Japan to the States or anywhere in the, in the world really? Um, I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about how technology plays a role uh, in the translation of the work. I think it's a very useful role and, and thank you for that question. Uh, one thing I noticed and you all can speak to maybe the same thing or, or something different, but there's a sense of collaboration. So it's not necessarily that someone went to, to university to become a videographer for theater or to become a technician for theater. They're a videographer for who knows what else and then they collaborate. The same thing is with musicians and actors. There tends to be a lot of collaboration. So like the company Nibrol, it's very, very advanced they're working in tandem in this kind of an equal sense with each other, so it's a collaborative vision. Uh, Kieran, the show that we saw with the um, sword fighting and everything, that one also super, super, super high-tech video projections and, and LED screens from Canada, from one of the most important companies in Montreal. So there's a lot of that coming and going, and I think the nice thing about video work in general is because of language barriers, it's it's easy to tour because you know you can package it up and it does give a visual where there might be the issue with language. So a lot of these 2.5D musicals use a lot, a lot, a lot of video projections. Um, it's not really about advanced or uh, behind or anything. It's just simply as uh, Cindy mentioned, it's if, uh, uh, artistically, creatively can collaborate uh, this knowledge and that knowledge together. For example, last week, was that last week? Uh, Lysomatics, the, uh, he, you know, the group which is really uh, considered as a top notch of the technology, not just a projection, but like a drone and uh, you know, many things. And uh, they presented as a dance work. And then dancers are choreographed by, choreographed by uh, the choreographer called Mikiko and then us. One of the rare things that the New York Times review, I totally agree with, that it didn't work as a theatrical or like a presentation on the stage. It's more like an attraction in um, exhibition or something like that. Yeah. So then I would say that what we will present next year is a dance work, but then uh, that is directed by Tabaimo, who is the, uh, the, the uh, visual artist who's uh, video work is very international, well known. And then rather than it's collaborate, uh, choreographer making a work, working <coughs> with the, uh, you know, the visual artist, it's, this is her first trial that the visual artist lead the whole thing to collaborate with the 
choreographer. So it's really, it's not, it's not really form of who is, who is uh, leading what, but it's really the uh, how organically uh, different genre people can work together. So that's, it's not really advanced or anything, it's matter. There's a kind of history of this too, because one of the projects I worked on with uh, some collaborators in Japan was uh, a book about the history of the Japanese group Dumb Type. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were active from the 1980s to the early 2000s, and they really pioneered the, the kind of new media performance aesthetic. And we interviewed some of the technicians who were young members of the company who joined a company that had a vision for a certain kind of um, interactivity of media and live performance. And they had to invent systems. They had to work out how to make a data projector speak to a laptop computer because in those days they, they were not designed really to speak to each other. So uh, really fascinating discussion with some of the, the people who were, became the technical staff but they had to educate themselves. Um, uh, I'm also thinking about the fact that the Australian performance artist Stellark, mm -hmm. who uh, worked a lot with robotic interactive technologies uh, into and immersing in his own body, lived for some 15 years in Japan and worked a lot with uh, medical technicians and robotic scientists to create the kind of interfaces mm -hmm. that he was wanting to create, which are very uh, kind of postmodern and cyborgian. But, um, but I think that points to this history of the, the way in which people would go to Japan because the technology was there, but then work with people to work out how to make it uh, uh, work in a performance context or a, a, even a, a kind of visual art context. Thank you. Some more a comment or a question? Yeah, all the way over there. Um, thank you so much. Um, I used to produce theater commercially in Japan, and I'm curious, um, since I've been here, I've seen a lot of intersection between not-for-profit theater and commercial theater here, and I would like to know how you perceive or how you um, see um, the relationship between public theater or not-for-profit theater and commercial theater in Japan. To all of you. Um I think they are totally two different <laughs> world. <laughs> it's totally different world. It it's not really. It has to be, but it's really a, 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 a big, thick wall between two of the world. The reason why is that it's not really about how uh, the monetary system or anything. It's more of like which one you exposed into the world and then your mind setting is totally different. Mm -hmm. And so in uh, Japan society, <coughs> for some reasons, many reasons, I presented kind of commercial theater, I mean the productions which considered as, or definitely commercial theater, uh, uh, maybe more than a few times. It's really amazed me how much different that their mindset thing are. And one of the good examples is that quite a long time ago, but then anyway, we, that theater has a one protagonist, uh, Sakamoto Ryoma. All Japanese knows, but no American knows. So in order to have the theater work as a theater to, to storytelling, we needed to have uh, a, a little moment who that person is. This is a historical person. So then in order to do that, we, we put the uh, uh, kind of animation of the, the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Then we made it, and then it was perfect. Then I told them that, well, this is, as I explained to you, we have a little three minutes of explanation of who he did. And then they means that the manager of that uh, commercial theater. Well, actually, we have already hired the video, uh, animation creator paying uh, in $3,000, and then, then we can't cancel it anymore. But it is great that you have it already, so this can be a great helpful to make that one. And then what they brought here was exactly same as my staff member make through the PowerPoint. But then they are paying $3,000. It's like, 
I mean, it's just a tiny little difference. One production has many, 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 many of these things. Why do you have to have this pay? Why do you have to spend this money? That is what I meant by totally different here. I, I, it's a great question, and it was something that really struck me because I'm also a producer, and looking at it in the similarities and the differences, because there's always this nonprofit versus commercial you look at in, in Europe and in any kind of a place. Japan was not really subsidized for a long time. This is kind of new. So in terms of what we understand as nonprofit, particularly Europe and America, wasn't really happening until was it around the 90s. And so commercial theater was kind of the only option besides the underground stuff. So the underground stuff was happening, but it was this vast divide of like fringe, do it yourself and commercial. And with the commercial, what I found very beautiful, and I hope you all got to understand that with uh, Gekaden Shiki, there is this culture of a company. And again, that can have a negative side too, of course, but their actors, and just imagine this on Broadway. You have a job for life. That doesn't really happen. So they have this entire dream factory where they're just building shows and, and employing staff all the time. That's special. I found that the corporate culture there is not the way that the um, commercial theater here is, which is very cutthroat. They're very supportive of each other and they believe in a deeper message. They believe in a meaning behind what they're doing, not just money only. So that's what I've seen. Thank you. Another, let's take the microphone for you, one second. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Eric Taylor. I'm an artistic director and choreographer based here in New York City. And thank you so much for what you've all brought to the table. It's um, very enlightening. My question is, as a choreographer with an extensive background in theater, from, starting from when I was a young child, how integral is dance in theater in Japan? And what styles of theater does dance present itself? And is buto considered theater, or is that just a dance form and how to, from each of you, I'd love to hear about that, about dance. Peter, maybe you? Uh, well, maybe I could do a little advertisement too because we are going to have a, um, a conference on Buto here at the university on the 31st of October and the 1st of November. Um, there's been a recent publication, The Routledge Companion to Buto. But the, speaking more broadly, the history of Buto is very complicated and a fascinating one because, of course, it began as an avant-garde practice in the 60s and then spread globally in the 1980s and became very popular in many different places around the world. And now we have Bhutto companies in, on almost every continent, as I far as I know. It. So <laughs> um, the question of what Bhutto is and what it might become is always under consideration, though. Bhutto artists are kind of obsessed with talking about the the kind of history and the invention and the reinvention of their own form. Um, there are some crossovers into more contemporary dance and then there are some uh, pushing back against that notion. There are some people who would preserve, like to preserve the kind of presumed border that uh, grew up between Bhutto and other forms of contemporary dance. But um, uh, the wider context of dance I'm much less um, uh, familiar with, um, so other, I'll, I'll defer to the other panelists. So, yeah. Maybe I could pick up from there. Um, I used to be a ballet dancer, actually, and um, ballet is the foremost, most popular, I think, format. Yeah. Yes, it sells tickets. It's wow. quite expensive. You have to pay like $150, like you go to the Met and you pay, I guess, approximately the same amount. Yeah. These tickets sell a lot in Japan because dance, in most, for most, excluding Tokyo, for most part of Japan, it's about doing it. So doing either ballet or Nihon Buyo, which is Japan, Japanese traditional dancing, mm -hmm. and you do that, and then you learn it from your master. And then you want to see the real master so that you go to these kind of performances, which are done by masters. So in that kind of closed circuit um, world, tickets are sold, but apart from that, dance is quite dead mm. in Japan. I mean, there's near zero contemporary wow, really? dance. Yeah, I mean, um, it just sucks. Yeah, <laughs> Why do you think that is? Though? There's no training. 
There's no training. Yeah, well, the training is is deficient, I and mean, also no way to go. Is it's there a, like what? Can you go to university for dance or no? No. 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 Not even for theater. No. So. Okay. That's that's. Uh, I That's actually very much related to Japanese history of performing arts because actors are lowest ranked really? human beings in feudalism in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are, you are laughing, but then really sort of untouchable um, rank of the human beings so in the feudalism. So my role is even the lowest in the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Actually, they're like, uh, the, the to top is the... Uh, uh, Shinoko's top is a samurai, second is a farmer, third is the, you know, uh, the, uh, the craftsman, the last is a merchant, and then, yeah. then, then, then everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> below is real, uh, yeah. And <laughs> so then, anyway, when Japan became westernized in mid 19th century, it was westernized means that you know high, higher education system Japanese learned from Western system, but then looking at their own, well, there's no way to put the performing artist into the higher education. So really, it's not a joke. This is really a, a reason why that we still do not have. Do you think it's going to come? It is happening slowly. But, um, but slowly means, anyway, most of the professional people who are working right now is already finished their higher education. So majority of the people who are making is nothing to do with the higher education. I think perhaps because of that, just, just to add on one thought, the dance that I have seen is exquisite. It's extremely innovative of what's coming from Japan. And I think partially, um, you know, those who do it, again, like Nibiru, like uh, Dershinera, really interesting companies that, again, are bringing that sense of physicality to all of their work. I find a lot of the traditional arts to, to look like it's rooted in dance or physicality, even though it's not how we see it. Some of the work that you presented of dance has been incredible. It's becoming very hard to bring a, find a new one, to be honest with you. Because most people survive abroad, actually. The mic, yeah. yeah. The good, yeah, they work in European exactly. companies. And now, um, and now Asia. A lot of the dance companies are now touring around Asia instead. Mm -hmm. Good. So maybe one last uh, uh, question from you. Hi, my name is Manam Fujita. I am from Japan. So I know there are not a lot of theater education programs in Japan, and Japanese people do not know how to see theaters. And also I know that a lot of companies are trying to bring new audiences, especially young audiences, by collaborating with like animation or comics. And Kabuki has... Uh, a lot of um, programs with like anime, and they had a performance based on the anime of One Piece and Naruto in Japan. And but I think young people go and see those performances because they know that specific anime or that specific comic. So if they, I I assume that if they go to see another performance or another original contemporary performances, probably a lot of people feel like, oh my God, I don't know what's happening over there. And so my question is how, how do you like sustain the audience engagement and audience development from that point? So you bring up a really good point and I'm glad you mentioned the One Piece Kabuki because it was something that we, didn't have time for in the video. Um, so Noma-san, the president of Shochiku, that was a discussion with a friend who was a manga publisher about how similar kabuki heroes are to, to those in, um, in manga and anime. And it was so successful. And what he was saying is he feels it's the most radical thing to happen to kabuki in 300 years or more. Because all of a sudden, the age group that was something like typically 50s and up was very mixed. So the way that he saw it, and whoa, 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 whoa. hello, I guess that's a telling us a sign. <laughs> Subtly. Um, <laughs> subtle, Michael, thank you. So what's exciting about that is it's evolving too, and how he viewed it and it has been seen as the success is that it's introducing the art form 
to, to both cross generations. So the exciting thing about merging them is you still have the traditionalists who love their kabuki who are going to see it, something new, and then you have those who maybe have never seen it before that are all of a sudden discovering, hey, actually this is pretty cool. So again, it is sustainable. Um, it seems to me that the most successful commercially right now is something that is fusing anime and, and manga. I mean, again, throngs of 20s to 30 year olds come in selling out every single show to see Prince of Tennis for the past 15 something years. So it's, it's important and it is important to build the younger audiences like um, the president of Gekin and Shiki was saying, the audiences are dying out. There's gonna be less of them. So you need to cultivate the youth. And that's something that American producers could think of too. Well, um, thank you, thank you. Maybe, Peter, if I can put you on the spot, like, are there tendencies you are seeing? How Japanese theater, what, can you make a prediction? See, I see these are things that are coming up on the horizon, which might be still the underground, where you say this is something that uh, will actually rise, or that might, uh, we see more of that. Well, I, I think there's a great diversity of activity. And one of the interesting things is that um, there's more I mean, I'm really speaking only about con the, the, the contemporary theatre movement, not so much the commercial sector, because I don't really know much about that. But there are more contemporary groups than there were in the past. I mean, we, we often, you know, my work was originally on the 1960s, and we endlessly cite and, and work on basically four or five companies. And now, when you look at the diversity of performance that is taking place, um, and you know, not just in contemporary styles, but also, you know, Yoko's programmed a lot of uh, w young women's voices, for example, over the last two years. So there's a whole emerging uh, um, theatre of uh, expressing viewpoints coming from maybe feminist perspectives. There's a lot of theatre that is more in the mode of theatre of the real. There's um, uh, um, some very interesting companies doing hybrid, you know, kind of traditional, traditionally influenced, but uh, updating it for contemporary contexts. So yeah, I don't think we can actually really simply summarize this. So um, I always just answer this question. One of the contributors is in, the, in the volume, is, uh, in, the, in the magazine, is a, a very distinguished uh, professor named uh, Tadashi Uchino, who's, um, uh, and he, I regularly consult him on when I go to Japan and uh, and he just, he told me once, well, we can't really say anything. Everybody's doing everything. So. Uh -huh. Well, this is a good, uh, that's a good, uh, a good end. Again, thank you all. Congratulations on this special issue. Yoko wants you all to come to see the show. It's in your program. <laughs> Peter, uh, Yoko, everybody, uh, Yoko and Cindy, of course. And uh, thank you. And also you, thanks for coming. We have that little reception around the corner and I have some drink tickets. So again, it's on 36 between Fifth and Madison on the uh, uh, south side in the middle, it's called the Archive Bar. We are there to celebrate that, so I hope you will come and join us. Again, thank you all for coming and uh, congratulations.